Hey guys, Adam from Splendid Sports, back again for another episode of Sports Card 3 and 3. This is episode number 21, and I am joined by Shane of Shoebox Legends. Hello, Shane. Hey, good evening. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Good evening. And uh, this is this is going to be exciting. This is going to be a lot of fun uh, for somebody who may be catching this as a first 3 and 3. It's pretty simple what we do. Uh, you know, we do a little hobby talk mixed in here and there but uh the general theme here is we're going to look at three of shane's favorite cards in his collection and we're going to talk about why and then we're going to look at three cards that are on his want list uh, using card ladder i'll bring up some images and we'll talk about why those are on his want list and uh wherever it goes from there so um shane you i, I wanted to bring this up because uh i've been thinking about this i saw uh, baseball collector mike made a video yesterday um and i forget the title was like what sports card videos are worthy to watch or are worth watching something like that so you know it was a title where uh it was like what's this about you know and uh, it was interesting because the the idea of it was he was kind of posing the question and how he finds it interesting that you know he'll do a video like recently he did one where he did a bunch of uh, he showed cards and he showed a bunch of one on one cards, you know, really great, awesome cards and a video. He's got a big channel, but it got like, you know, six or seven hundred views, uh, which for him is not that many, you know. And then he'll do he did like a few days before he did a video where he had a PSA return and uh, he was talking about how PSA is grading harsh and it got like whatever, six or seven thousand views. So <laughs> it's just funny that the, the difference between. The, the average card video where you're just showing cards and then when you have a strong opinion about something or whether it may be negative uh, towards the negative side of, uh, you know, looking at a company like PSA uh, or whatever it may be. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that because you recently uh, made a pretty big change in your channel for tell me about it. Like so for whatever the first two years or so of being on YouTube, you wouldn't you wouldn't be on camera, right? Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm an introvert. Uh, once I get to know somebody, I kind of open up and get more comfortable. But by nature, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable uh, just being around and, and being on video. Um, it's kind of, I think it was one of the reasons I wrote a blog for many years before I got into YouTube, just the anonymity of, you know, being behind the keyboard and kind of separating uh, my work life and my professional life from my hobby. Um, so when I got on YouTube, there was there was definitely remnants of that. And uh, for the first two years and like five or six hundred videos, uh, it was just my hands and and the cards because um, I just I wasn't comfortable. Um, but recently, you know, after giving it more thought, kind of some encouragement from uh, friends of mine in the hobby, have gotten a little bit more comfortable coming out of my shell, and uh, it has made a big difference. Um, I'll tell you, I I've noticed for whatever reason, like uh, videos where the thumbnail, you know, has me in my room in it or me holding up a card, they get way more views than uh, just the videos where it's just hands and cards. Uh, I'm not sure the reason why. I think it's probably because we all have a lot of the same cards. And I think what makes the content interesting to some people is the the stories behind it and the personalities behind it. And I think that, you know, comes across a lot more when you're willing to show yourself on, on video. So I get it for, for the people that are shy. Uh, I've been there. It took me two years to, to show my face. But uh, if you're on the fence, I would encourage, you know, just coming out. Everybody's very welcoming. And uh, it does seem to be, you know, more uh, receptive when you when you get out there and put yourself out. Yeah, I, I think because I mean, I feel like a lot of uh, people in the YouTube community, uh, one of the if not the only reason, if if not, it's the main reason that they have a YouTube channel is they want to connect with with other collectors. And uh, maybe it's something just about seeing a face that it feels easier to connect with it somehow, you know, it personalizes the channel a little more. Uh, maybe that, that could be that could be a reason. But yeah, I've thought of that, too. I, you know, I watch channels where, you know, I watched your channel even, I even, I saw a bunch of your videos even before you ever went on camera. And, you know, I love the way you talked about the cards and the cards you showed, but yeah, there's something a little different when even like a, uh, the beginning of a video, you just pop on and start talking on camera and then turn the camera around. I, I, I like that a little more. I don't know why. It's just, I feel like I'm, I'm getting to know you better than if it was just all, you know, the camera the other way. It's yeah, I feel the same. It was sort of like ripping off a Band-Aid to an extent. You know, I yeah. felt a little awkward. I've done a couple with Dylan uh, and on some other channels. And it's like anything else. You, you do it two or three times and you start to uh, feel like it's second nature. So, yeah, I mean, when I when I started just throwing myself on camera, it felt weird, you know, because it's not I was not <laughs> used to doing anything like that. 
but yeah, now it's it's getting feeling more normal, and and uh, I think it does allow your channel and, and allow you to connect better with the the community out there. But you know, along the lines of Mike's questions that he was posing, an, an interesting topic was like, what do you think? What do you think the reason for that is? Um, you know, is it is it just that like people are attracted to like a, a more of an opinionated video? whether it be about PSA or opinionated about, I mean, not that Mike makes these, but there's a lot of channels that make videos where they're given an opinion on like a person in the hobby and those get a ton of views. Like, is it just that shock factor? People are looking for something where it's a heavy opinion, basically. I really think that's probably just uh, human nature to an extent, you know, same reason people want to look at the tabloids and, and the grocery line. Um, and it, it really depends what you're looking to get out of the platform, I guess. I'm, I'm looking to connect with people that are more collectors. I don't pay close attention to my subscriber count, uh, things like that. So I don't, I don't really pay attention to a lot of that noise or uh, watch those types of channels. I'm more likely to just watch people that are talking about their own experience in the hobby, uh, maybe have you know 500 or less subscribers, but um, a, a high level of knowledge or are passionate about what they're doing. I'd rather tune into that. Uh, I want to, I want to learn something about the hobby when I'm consuming YouTube content uh, versus like the gossip side of things. So I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, to other channels. Yeah. Do you, now, do you think it's, uh, so when a video goes, cause I know how, I know how Google works. It's part of, part of what I do for my job uh, is, is working with Google on the search side. Um, but YouTube is owned by Google. So it's, it's really the same, in my opinion, the same type of algorithm and formula and how they rank things, how they show certain videos over others. Um, for me, I think Google's all about advertising. Google, that's how they make their money. So do you think it's that Mike, Mike's a perfect example in those two videos. Do you think it was that they just showed his PSA video more in the feed? Uh, so there were more people that saw it, or do you think that like his, uh, card showing video got just as much visibility, but less people decided to click on it? Um, I, th th that's an interesting way to, I kind it's of, it's a good it. question. My uh, my gut instinct would be the former, um, that maybe the algorithm just put that out there based on keywords. And the only reason I say that, I have other friends who have channels that are similar in size to mine. You know, maybe they average one to 200 views a video and they'll post a, a grading reveal and get like 3,000 views, you know, out of left field. And then the very next video, they'll be back down to, you know, one to 200. So I don't think that could be wholly based on just who's deciding to click. I'm sure there's uh, something that goes on where the algorithm determines that, you know, those grading reveals are a popular topic based on keyword or something and kind of floats those into more people's uh, lists or something like that. It's it's pretty fascinating to think about. Yeah. I mean, I, you, so YouTube is for maybe they won't come out and say this, but I from looking at a lot of this stuff with, for my job, um, they're basically for me, you know, they, they're looking to throw out videos and, and on search, throw out results that will get their ads clicked on basically that's how they make their money so maybe you know they their their ads that they show on on someone's video is basically determined by the title and what google's like oh what's this video about by what the person says on it and so forth so maybe google thinks hey if, if the video is about psa we can show certain types of ads on it that will get, be more likely to get clicked where if it's just about you know showing cards Maybe the algorithm isn't so sure what the video is about, so they're just not going to show it as much as because um, that's what they want. They want that first video, that first ad that shows. They want that to get clicked on. I mean, and that's how they make more of their money, not just by people watching the video, but by clicking on that ad and going to PSA's website or whoever's advertising on that video, essentially. Right. Uh, something just to kind of close the topic. Something I've heard Mike say, baseball collector, that I think is kind of interesting. Is uh, I'm paraphrasing, but you know something along the lines of you'd rather have four quarters than a hundred pennies. And that's sort of how I feel like being on this platform, I've probably got a dozen or a couple dozen really close friends that I talk with every week now, text with, we talk on the phone. Um, and that's something that I've never really had in the hobby before. And to me, that's, there's more value in that than there is in having, you know, 3000 subs, but not really developing a relationship with any of them. So hundred percent I'm with you. And I, I've actually, we'll end it here, but that, I've heard uh, people say that like, I don't even want to, I don't want more people following my channel. I don't want, uh, I can't handle all the comments as it is. So there's a, there's a bunch of people here who have just kind of found their sweet spot. 
you know, I get whatever people watching my videos, they're my friends and I'm not looking for the excess, you know? So it's, it's just funny how, you know, the, the people are in it for the, for different reasons. So that's, I guess, if you're starting up a YouTube channel, figuring out what am I doing this for? What's my goal here? Is it to make connections or is it me? Like, I want to be a YouTube star and I'm going to try to make a bunch of money on YouTube. There's two different paths there. Totally. Right. <laughs> just like with collecting and, you know, that's the beauty of it. There's no right or wrong approach and uh, it just depends what you want to get out of it. So, yeah, I'm with you. Now, that being said, guys, if you like three and threes, hit the damn like button. All right. <laughs> hit that algorithm. Smash it, baby. You know, we there'll be a link below to Shoebox Legends. So. Yeah, and there's a link. I mean, I want you to subscribe. To, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think I want people to watch this, uh, you know, so because uh, I just the, the more people that watch it, the more connections I can make. But the right people watching it. So. If you like these, this is your type of content. Hit the like button, man. Anyway, I think that was the first time I've ever said that in like two years or whatever. <laughs> it, felt, it felt totally weird. But anyway, we'll move, we'll move past that, Shane. Um, let's get into the cards because that's generally what we're here for. Let's uh, look at you have three of your favorite cards ready. Let's look at number one on that. I do. So I tried to uh, just real quick um, try to kind of shows some of the variety in my collection across these first three cards. I admire, you know, some of the people that you've had on that are just strictly vintage baseball or, you know, really focus in one area. I, I cannot focus. Um, I do have some projects I finished, but I, I sort of like having a broad uh, variety in my collection. So I tried to encapsulate that across the, the three choices. This was super hard. Uh, but the first one I'm going to go with is, is kind of random. It's not even from one of the four major North American sports. Uh, and it's a pre-war card. I've had it for a few years, and I, I think it's kind of a sneaky good card. Uh, it's the 1937 uh, Ogden's Cigarettes, uh, Jesse Owens. Wow. And um, if you're familiar with his story, let me try to get it out of the glare here. But um, just really, really impressive uh, athlete. Um, basically, you know, had a very tough upbringing. Grew up, uh, was born in Alabama. Uh, moved north uh, with his family to Ohio at like age nine. Um, but he was alive in, you know, the 20s and 30s growing up when it was a very different time for uh, black athletes in our country. And he faced a lot of adversity that uh, I don't think modern athletes uh, could possibly relate to. Um, even when this guy was becoming like a global superstar in high school and college, um, he couldn't eat at the same restaurant as his teammates. Uh, he couldn't stay on campus in college. Um, so the amount of adversity that he faced, um, I just think is really, really impressive. And I think he's admirable for some of the same reasons as, you know, Jackie Robinson and others. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's incredible to me to think uh, what he experienced in his lifetime and what he's most known for um, in case anyone's not aware is, is winning uh, multiple gold medals in the 1936 Olympics uh, in Berlin, Germany, in front of, uh, Hitler and the Nazi party that was rising uh, in Germany at the time. And, and heading into that Olympic Games, uh, Hitler really viewed that as an opportunity to kind of show the dominance of, of the Aryan race. And instead, you know, this 22-year-old kid just out of college went over there from the United States and won four gold medals uh, in front of that nation and that crowd. And when you, when you think about that, I think it's just uh, incredibly admirable. And he's not someone... Uh, I don't think who gets talked about a lot in the hobby. Um, you know, obviously doing track and field, that's not a highly collected sport. Uh, but I think he's one of the most important sports figures of the 20th century um, when you really think about it. And was certainly part of a couple of the most significant, you know, individual moments in sports um, in, in the 20th century as well. And so um, decided a few years ago that I wanted to get one card of his um, into the collection He's got quite a few out there. In fact, our, our mutual friend, Doug uh, Decon, has a, a few Jesse Owens cards. Um, but I settled on this one because I, I just love the image, uh, you know, this color image. I love that it's a tobacco card. Uh, it was issued by Ogden Cigarettes. And I love that it's a 1937 set uh, that is actually called Champions of 1936. So on the back of this card, you know, although it's in German uh, and I can't really read it, um, I can read enough to, to uh, verify that it does talk specifically uh, about those gold medals uh, that he got uh, in, in those summer games. So for all those reasons, um, just love this card. Wow. And that was beautifully said. And you're right. That's that's world history right there. That is like that transcends sports for sure. 
And, yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, he's most known for the Olympic feat, but the year prior to that, uh, 1935, when he was in college, at a single college meet, he set or tied four world records in an hour in, in one track meet. And it's been referred to as the greatest hour in sports, um, you know, at the time. Uh, he was recognized at the end of the 20th century by both, I think, ESPN and the BBC as like a top six athlete of the, the 20th century. So I just think it's uh, a really cool card of uh, uh, someone who deserves our admiration and um, it's fascinating me to try to put myself in his shoes and uh, think about what he went through in that time period. There's a, a famous photo of him uh, after winning one of his gold medals where he's on the podium in Berlin and the entire crowd and all the other athletes on the podium are all giving the Nazi salute. And he's just standing there by himself, you know, saluting the American flag. And it's just uh, such a, a moving image. And I think uh, just somebody to be admired and a beautiful card that you don't really hear very much about. So, no, you do. I mean, I've heard his story, not, not really told like that. I, you know, I've kind of heard bits and pieces, but man, that was, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, of course. I've never seen that card too. So great, great choice there. All right, let's go. Number two. All right. So number two, I'm a big hockey collector. So I, I had to represent and do one hockey card here on my list of three. Uh, we will get to baseball for the third one. I know not everybody's uh, huge on hockey, but um, hockey is what got me into the hobby back in the late 80s. So my brothers and I, we played youth hockey uh, in Connecticut, learned how to skate when we were five years old and you know played growing up. And in the late 80s, early 90s, we didn't have internet access or really any way to learn about the game. And so one of the ways that my dad kind of encouraged us uh, to get to know more about the game was by buying us hockey cards. So he would stop on his way home from work and he would get packs of 89.90 Opeachy and Topps hockey cards, just like the one that you see here. And my brothers and I, we would sit around the kitchen table. We would rip these open. Uh, we would trade. We would sort them into these binders uh, that my dad created for us. I still have my, this is my original childhood hockey binder from 1990 with my you know label on the front that my dad created nice. these are like software manuals that he had from work you know printed out a little cover and we would sort all these cards by team uh trade with each other and it was very um just an enjoyable time that was uh very innocent and almost reminiscent of what it was probably like to collect as a kid like in the 50s so i, I got hooked on hockey cards um got into baseball later um, about a year later, was was really getting into the sport, uh, idolizing Wayne Gretzky. Um, he was he's the best hockey player in the world. Uh, so when I was nine, I took one of my doubles that I had of a Wayne Gretzky card. Um, I had gotten an address for him um, either through a Beckett magazine or a friend, and I'm not sure exactly uh, where it came from. But I sent a TTM off to Wayne Gretzky. And every day I, I checked the mailbox, I felt you know, like Ralphie looking uh, for my uh, little orphan Annie secret decoder. And you know, a few months later, did get the card back, uh, signed by number 99, Wayne Gretzky. It's a little bit difficult to see the auto here because I was nine, so I didn't choose probably the best card to send. Um, it's just what I had doubles of. Uh, it's actually the French version, so I can't even read the back. Um, but I sent it off. Um, and it was just so cool to get something back in the mail uh, from an idol of mine um, in the game and the person who many recognize as the all-time greatest player ever to play. Uh, my parents had taken me to see Gretzky play in person uh, in Hartford uh, against the Whalers. I was a big Whalers fan growing up, um, and it was shortly after that that I sent this off. Um, so it became, you know, like one of the most epic cards of my childhood collection um, I don't have everything from when I was a kid. Some stuff was lost in, you know, basements and other things, but I've held on to this card um, and I'm just really grateful uh, to have it. It's probably one of the most sentimental cards in my entire collection and uh, just felt like an important one to, to uh, bring to the episode because every time I look at it, it just takes me right back to that kitchen table with my brothers and my dad, um, you know, way back in the day, 30 plus years ago. Um, telling stories, laughing at funny names, trading cards. And um, it's really what got me started and, and got me anchored in the hobby that I'm still enjoying uh, to this day, 30 plus years later. So this is the the one and only TTM I ever sent. I, I mic dropped it on, on TTMs yeah. after that. And Wonderful. I'll probably never send another, but it's uh, I don't think I could get a more memorable one 
uh, than this card. So you have the best batting average with TTMs ever. You got right. the, great, the great one to sign that, and he's got a really nice signature there too. And he's he put the ninety nine under there. Man. Yeah, it's fantastic. He's got uniform number, and uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I wondered like whether my dad maybe put this in the mailbox or something. <laughs> I, I guess I'll never know, but uh, you know, in looking at other autos of his from the era, and now that I'm an adult, I have a couple certified uh, Gretzky autos, and it, it does look uh, absolutely legit. And uh, my dad swears that uh, you know it, it actually did come back in the mail from uh, from Gretzky. So whether or not that it, it is the case, you know, it's the story and, and the card that makes it. Uh, priceless to me and uh, even if I sold every other card that I own uh, at some point in the future this is one I'll just always keep with me because it's it's priceless I love that and you know what if your dad did sign that for me it might even be a cooler story right <laughs> so either way it's awesome and a little wrinkle on that one sort of like a 1b I, I don't want to cheat like some other people I've seen recently on here trying to sneak in extra cards but uh, since we recently did an episode with Dylan on buybacks um, this was a cool tie-in so about a year ago uh, Leaf now owns the rights to ProSet, who made this card originally in 91. Uh, they made three hockey sets, and then they went bankrupt. So there's not a lot of ProSet out there. Uh, so they own the rights, Leaf. And about a year ago, they produced buybacks of those original ProSet hockey cards, uh, numbered to five and numbered to one. And I was able to pick up one of the Gretzky's, you know, that same Gretzky that I got uh, TTM autographed in uh, buyback format. And it's a little bit difficult to make out here. Uh, in the light, but it is serial numbered on uh, the upper corner out of five. So it was cool to get uh, buyback and tie that part of my collection to, you know, my first ever uh, TTM auto. So that, I, I love the uh, pro set cards, you know, that even the one, you know, the ones they did for football too. pro set, man, I was a huge fan of those. They printed a million of them. They were colorful. They looked great, but uh, yeah, they, they just didn't last as a company. So great photos though. They had great action photos in a lot of those. So yeah, I'm with you, man. Awesome. You know, and I, I do have to say, Lee, you know what was confusing to me when I when I um, kind of started paying attention to the hobby a couple years ago again, um, the Leaf thing confused me because it was like, oh, yeah, Leaf is still around. And then then I looked it up and it's like the current Leaf has no affiliation to the Leaf that we knew, like that came out with the 90 Leaf set for baseball or, you know, the 48, 49 Leaf. Totally different. It's just the same name but no not the same company at all right <laughs> right no same way. uh same thing with upper deck owning fleer and fleer ultra and it's just yeah. uh, funny how that goes yeah that was confusing to me but yeah now i i gotta figure it out so all right that was uh that was number two right so we got one more number three yes uh so this is another one that's kind of tied to my childhood uh to, to me like nostalgia is a big part of the hobby and it's a big part of why i love collecting so i, I collect modern stuff as well i'm really all over the map but the cards that mean the most to me are the ones that I can tie to, you know, an event in my life or particularly my childhood run of collecting. And I've heard others tell the story that are around our age. But um, when I was a kid in the early 90s, I, I couldn't get vintage cards. They, they just weren't available to me. I was kind of limited to what my neighborhood friends had and my brothers and I um, just wasn't an option. But what we could get were these uh, Topps Archives cards that came out in 1991. And these were just a reprint of the 53 Topps baseball set. Um, so you could get these in packs, uh, like 10, 12 cards a pack, whatever they were, at the hobby shop, you know, right alongside my 91 Topps and 91 Upper Deck baseball packs. And it gave me an opportunity, you know, again, in that era before the internet, where it wasn't easy to learn about a lot of these guys or see a lot of these cards, to experience all these 53 Topps cards. And, and that really stoked my love of vintage baseball cards that continues to this day and more specifically you know made me kind of fall in love with the 53 top set um, which to this day is my favorite vintage set uh, largely because of of this release this was as close as i could get um, at age eight to uh, an actual 50s tops card and so i would just spread these things out on my bedspread and just pour over them uh, for hours just reading the backs and getting to know about these players. So as an adult collector, uh, when I got back in about 15 years ago, I immediately gravitated towards 53 tops because um, the idea of owning an authentic, you know, original 53, which I wasn't able to do as a kid, was just so appealing to me. Um, so I've, I've been building that set slowly over the last 15 years. And there are a bunch of cards I could have chosen to go with uh, from the release, but I chose one that's really, really iconic. And it was the first big card purchase that I ever made 
uh, when I got back in as an adult. So it's it's the satchel page, uh, 53 tops. Whoa, look at that baby. Yeah, it's just a gorgeous card. I mean, um, again, just an athlete that it's so easy to admire. Um, the card itself is just so beautiful. And I, I would, you know, I know this is a sensitive uh, word, but I wouldn't hesitate to use the I word iconic uh, for this one. I think, you know, even Tops agrees. They did, uh, back in 2011, they did a list of the top 60 baseball cards they'd ever produced uh, for their 60th anniversary. And the page, uh, 53 Tops page was included um, on that list. It's his only Tops card. Um, as many people know, he does have a Bowman and a Leaf. Uh, from the late 40s, but I sort of like the idea that in getting this one card, I could I could kind of have a complete tops run of of uh, Satchel Page. He's a fascinating person. I'm not qualified to give a whole breakdown on his uh, life and career, but I think it's amazing that you know he won a World Series and was a multiple time All Star, even though he didn't debut in Major League Baseball until he was like 42 years old. And um, to think that he wasn't able to start his Major League career until an age where, you know, most people have already wrapped it up, uh, but was still able to have that much success is just awesome. Uh, he won a Negro League World Series as well and was a multiple time all-star, you know, in the Negro League. So he's one of the ultimate kind of what could have been uh, players in terms of, you know, it had baseball integrated sooner uh, and he had been able to play his whole career in the majors. Who knows what uh, his numbers would look like, but um, yeah, it's, it's about the player. Um, but also about the card and the set. It's it's my favorite vintage set, and I think it's arguably the most beautiful card uh, from that release. It's right up there with the mantle and, and the Jackie Robinson and and the Willie Mays. So, Whew, man, that's so that's a PSA six. But man, that thing is so. I mean, uh, that's a great grade for a fifty three tops card, and it looks man, it looks every bit the grade, if not better, from here. Man, that thing is beautiful. Yeah, so this is, um, I would not buy this in a six today. This this is more of a sign of my longevity in the hobby. So um, I got back in in the fall of 2007. And the story here is in, in January 2008, I got my yearly performance bonus from work that I get every January. And I was 25 years old and I decided that I would treat myself to one kind of big card because I kept a pretty tight hobby budget uh, at that age when I was trying to get settled into adulthood. I would limit myself to like, hundred dollars a month on cards and stick pretty strictly to that so i could never really get some of these types of cards so when i got that first bonus back in it was like i'm gonna i'm gonna get one card that's you know maybe three or four hundred dollars which seemed insane at the time and uh, i chose this one and you know in retrospect it ended up being you know one of the better purchases i've made uh since getting back in the hobby so i, I figured you bought it a while back because it's got the zero serial number starting on psa with the old label i got a bunch of vintage cards like that mickey mantles that i got you know 2014 or something and yeah it's got the old label the old certification number and uh yeah it's a similar story with me with i remember opening 89 bowman packs and they reprinted a bunch of the old bowman 53 bowman cards the mickey yep. mantle um you know all the classic cards from that 53 bowman and uh I just always loved the 53 Bowman. And that was one, one of the first mantles I got uh, was that 53 Bowman Mickey Mantle, like, you know, five or six years ago. So uh, it just meant, meant so much to me because I was opening those reprint ones out of those packs. And I was like, I always, something about that image, the 53 Mantle, like that photo with him swinging in the blue sky. And I just remember as a kid loving that and being able to, when I was older, get the original was like, I felt like I really accomplished something. Like <laughs> it was awesome. Same, I'll, I'll be honest. When I was a kid, that, that that mantle was the card for me too from that archive set. I went with the page because I wanted to show something here that I've never shown before on my channel, and I've I've shown the mantle before. But yeah, that I, to this day I still prefer the '53 mantle over the '52, just because that archive set really just ingrained that yep. that image in me as a kid. So yep. Awesome, man. Wow. Those were, I love it. Love those cards you showed. Um, let's go here. Now we're going to look at three on your want list. You sent me the list. I got the first one pulled up here. This is, now I'm going to say this is officially, I believe this is the first hockey card ever on three and three on the want list. So awesome. this here is the 1951 Parkhurst Gordie Howe. And I just pulled up one that sold uh, PSA two sold back in January 
And this is a pricey card, man. This thing sold for 7,500 bucks in a PSA 2. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I tried to get some variety here into the three wants. This is definitely the big reach out of the three. That's kind of a lifetime goal for me. Um, huge card, but um, over the, I've done a whole bunch of different things in collecting in the 15 years I've been back in. I've been, you know, a player collector, a team collector, set builder. Um, but what I've settled on over the last like five years or so is, is just being a collector of all time greats across all the sports. And so I started taking like an analytical approach, looking at each sport, you know, ranking the top guys in those sports and finding out who I'm missing uh, to make my collection more complete. And in the realm of hockey, he sticks out like a sore thumb. If I look at the top 10 scorers of all time, I've got nine of their rookie cards. And the, and the one that I don't have is Gordie Howe. And uh, so this is a card that I would love to put to bed. Um, it's very expensive, like you said. A uh, couple things about it that might work in my favor. Uh, number one, I, I can't afford to just buy this card flat out, or I wouldn't, um, you know, put that amount of money into it. But uh, I've been a big collector of graded cards over the years. Uh, ever since I got back in, honestly, I've been buying graded cards since 2008. And, you know, to each his own, I understand the, the arguments for and against. One of the things I love about them is that they're they're more, they're easily liquidable compared to uh, raw cards. And it's, it's easy to trade up into a bigger card like this. So would I spend six or $7,000 of my own money on a Gordie Howe rookie? No. Uh, but would I trade, you know, 20 or 30 cards or sell them and, and stash the money and use those uh, to pay into one of these? Possibly. And, and I'd probably get more enjoyment out of that one Gordie Howe than maybe I'd get out of all the cards that I'd have to sell to acquire it. And it's something I've done before. So I have a, a very big basketball card that just uh, didn't make the list tonight, but um, easily could have and uh, picked it up a few years ago. And I sold 36 graded cards over a period of like two or three months to raise the money uh, to go after that one basketball card. So I'd be looking to do something similar here with the Gordie Howe where um, I would just identify some things that maybe I don't appreciate as much, have a, you know, a big sale and see if I can raise, you know, the majority of the funds. The, the other thing that's kind of a trick to this one um, that would help me out, it's a blank back. Um, so there's nothing on the back of these at all. So I've seen some of the lower grades probably the case for the one you have pulled up here where the front looks great. And the reason it gets a one or two is there's glue damage or a paper loss on the back. I am totally fine with that given that the back is a plain brown back that looks like a brown paper bag. Um, so I'd be looking for like a one or two, uh, maybe with some back damage that makes the front look uh, really nice by comparison. Awesome. That's the first time I've ever looked at the Gordie Howe rookie card. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a big hockey guy other than, I actually don't have any hockey cards, but if there was one I was going to get, it and it's an expensive card too, it would be the Bobby Orr rookie card. Yeah, I mean, generally Bobby Orr, I would get. Bobby Orr, Wayne Gretzky, and Gordie Howe are really the only three answers you'll typically get to who was the best hockey player of all time. And they each played in different eras, so it's hard to uh, compare against. You know, the other thing that's tough about this set just like in baseball, how there was kind of a gap where they weren't producing any cards for a number of years, the same thing happened in hockey. So he was playing before 1951, as were a lot of other players, but there weren't any sets issued. And so this particular Parker set that came out in 51 has tons of rookie cards of Hall of Famers because it's really the rookie of anyone who had debuted for four or five years prior to that. So, Got it. All right. Beautiful choice there. I love it. Uh, let me pull up the second one. It is a 1996 guy named Michael Jordan. If you ever heard of him? <laughs> and it is a man. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I honestly haven't pulled up an image even before, but I think I'm gonna like this card because I love Skybox. I love the EX because I, I got some Tom Brady EX card. Let's see what we got here. Uh, probably not the best picture, but. Is this it right here? That is the card. So this is this is the one of the three that is the most attainable. Uh, I try to give you one that I could probably easily knock out in the next few months. One that's really a, a big fish like that Gordie Howe and then kind of a middle ground one. Um, so this would be the easy one. Uh, I'd probably look to pick this card up in like a PSA 9, which you can easily do for maybe $300 somewhere in that range. Um, but I, I love this because, again, trying to just fill out my collection a little bit. I never really collected basketball or football much until the last five years. 
I'm not going deep in on those sports, but I want to selectively just get a handful of cards um, that I think are just cool for whatever reason. And I have the big Jordan card. I wanted a card from the 90s to, to put with it. Um, this one came, you know, right from the height of their second run of championships when he was really the king of the world of sports. And uh, even if you weren't a basketball fan in the 90s, he, his popularity transcended, you know, the sport of basketball, as we all know. And I love this card because it, it's a base card, um, but it's an incredible. Like, I just think it it shows the creativity that came out of the 90s because of all the competition. Um, all of these companies like Skybox and Upper Deck and Score and Pops were just competing against each other and driving innovation. And, you know, for this card has like a shiny foil border. It's got like gold foil inlay. The middle part of the card there uh, where it looks purple behind his photo is actually acetate. Um, it's, it's a see-through card in the middle. Um, so it, it's just like an incredibly built card. Um, and I just think the build quality of it is something that we don't see a lot of. Um, oddly enough, like 25 or 30 years later, it almost seems like we've regressed a little bit. Uh, maybe some of that is just the, the monopolies that exist and uh, the companies aren't forced to be as creative as they were in the 90s. But uh, to me, it's it's this one's about the card as much as it is the player um, and just how unique that is for a base card. And I think, you know, the prices, the market prices kind of back that up um, to think that a base card that came out of a pack in 1997, you know, goes for three hundred dollars and a PSA nine um, 25 years later is kind of fascinating. I figured <clears throat> like a lot of the, like a lot of the cards from this era, there's a huge gap. I, I actually just just was curious. So I pulled up a PSA 10 and it's funny, right? The PSA seven we looked at, which honestly looked very similar, you know, from the front at least, <laughs> you know, uh, it was like sold for 83 bucks. And then the PSA 10 here recently sold for almost 3000. So you're looking at 2,800 bucks. This one sold on March 1st uh, with Probstein. So like a lot of these cards, the gap from like even a nine to a 10 is like huge, you know? Yeah. And you know, you hear this all the time, but this is a card I would be buying just to enjoy in my own collection. So I'm I'm a uh, subscriber to the you know collect nines, sell tens mm -hmm. theory. So I'd be I'd probably be looking at this in an eight five or a nine just to have a nice copy that I know is authentic that I can enjoy displaying. But the the ex I know for football the ex cards even though like this is a base card I'm not sure what the populations are but um, like with like Tom Brady ex cards there's very low population so I. I even though these are base cards, maybe they didn't make as many as like some of the other cards from that era, you know? So uh, generally I think that EX brand, that was like not as mass produced as some of the other ones. Yeah. And, and one final thing that I like about this one is that this is from an era where the designs were used across sports still, which I love. Like I, I really, really miss that uh, in, in the age of monopolies that we're living in here, but it's awesome to me that you can have this card in a Michael Jordan in a PSA 9, and then right next to it on my desk, I can have Ken Griffey Jr. from the same set with the same design and just have those two kind of titans of the 90s side by side on the same card. It's just really cool. I know. I love that too. Um, all right. So no, number three is the 1954 Bowman Ted Williams. And yeah. So this one, um, you know, while I had the, the archives cards as a kid in the 90s, I didn't have any authentic uh, 50s tops cards, as I mentioned, but I did have a couple of Bowman commons. And so I really got attached to the 50s Bowman cards. And I love them to this day, um, kind of casually accumulating as many of them as I can. I wouldn't call it set building because there's there's some big cards in there I'm missing, but um, trying to focus on Ted Williams because being here in New England, uh, he's obviously a legend, arguably the greatest hitter of all time, depending, depending on who you talk to. Um, and I have his other two Bowman cards from 50 and 51. Just need the 54 to kind of complete the trifecta of his Bowmans. The other thing that's fascinating about this, which I think a lot of people probably know already, this is a card that was like an early version of a short print almost. Um, it was pulled from production early on in the print run because Williams signed an exclusive contract with Topps. And, you know, Topps took legal issue with the fact that Bowman was printing Ted Williams in the 54 release. Um, so this card got pulled by Bowman, you know, relatively early in the print run. And what they did is they created a second Jim Pearsall card, uh, who is already card number 220 in the set. So like, this is, 
you know, this is Jim Pearsall's card, number 220. There's also a Jim Pearsall, which on the back, instead of two, uh, sorry, 210, um, instead of 210, it's number 66. Uh, because at some point in the print run, when they had to pull that Ted Williams card, they scrambled and the best they could come up with was just to take this Pearsall and just recycle it in on the checklist um, a second time. So you can find Pearsall in both numbers, uh, but Ted Williams is only card number 66. And of course, there's a, a limited number of those compared to every other uh, 54 Bowman that was printed for the you know entirety of the print run. And so I love that concept of scarcity. Um, I think nowadays it's generally agreed upon that it's maybe not as scarce as uh, it was once thought to be, but it, it's scarce enough. I mean, if you go out and uh, look up any other Hall of Famer from 54 Bowman, there's a lot more options uh, on eBay and, and my slabs to pick up their cards and the, the Williams cards are very limited. So this one is, you know, maybe in between. It's certainly uh, not that Gordie Howe rookie level, uh, but it's not a cheap card like that, a cheaper card like that Jordan either. Yeah, like this one here sold recently in February, fifty five hundred bucks for a really, you know, really nice PSA seven. Obviously, you wouldn't have to get something that high grade, but um, yeah, it's a it's an expensive card. But to your point, yeah, I noticed that too. The uh, when you look at the population of it, it, I was like, you know, it, it's not as low of a population out there as I thought. But I think it's just that you know, people love the story, right? They love the story of a card got taken out and it's short printed, and that sometimes that's all it takes. Now it's a, it's a beautiful card. It's Ted Williams. It's a look at that image, the blue sky in the background. Uh, it's just a fantastic looking card. But you combine that with the story of it, and and you know that's what it takes sometimes only for a card like this to have a life of its own. So this is yeah, this is a I don't have this card, but um, yeah, I would love to have a copy of this card for sure. It's uh, it's a classic. Yeah, Ted Williams doesn't have a ton of cards either. Really? He really doesn't. I, I've, never been able, I've never been able to substantiate it, but I've always kind of wondered too if you know this whole story is maybe the reason why, or some of the motivation between behind Tops featuring him as the first and last card in the '54 set, just to kind of rub it in a little bit to Bowman yeah. and kind of stick it to them. Uh, so I just think that that back and forth um, is is kind of fascinating, and of course Bowman, you know, collapsed as a brand just a year or so later. So. Love it, man. That that was awesome. Great choices all around. Um, I like to at the end of these, if you got a channel you want to mention uh, for maybe a future three and three, or even just a channel you'd want to mention as a, a channel that you like that uh, I could discover through this. I'm always looking to find new channels. So if you got anyone maybe that I don't know of or someone you want to recommend, I would love to hear it. Yeah, so you've hit, I, I was going through my subscriber uh, or subscribe channels list and you've hit on quite a few of them that uh, that do show their faces and would be willing to do this. But I did think of a couple. Uh, one is Ken over at Ken's Cardboard is his channel. Um, yeah. He's been around quite a while, you know, a few years longer than I have on YouTube anyway. Um, really great guy, a vast collection, vintage, modern, uh, multiple sports and uh, very friendly uh, guy that I've gotten to know. So I would, I would highly recommend Ken at Ken's Cardboard. And uh, the other one I thought of is uh, Sammy. He's at uh, SFI Sports Cards uh, here on YouTube. Uh, another guy who just has a really great variety in his collection and someone whose knowledge of baseball is like insane. Uh, he, he's done these installments where he'll open a pack of cards from the 80s and he'll look at the back and just slide up to just see the statistics and the facts without seeing the player name and try to guess who it is. And he bats like, 800 um you know and these guys that i don't think anybody's ever heard of so i'm always impressed uh by his baseball knowledge and the variety in his collection so i think sammy would be a, a good choice as well awesome great choices I'll, i'm gonna tag those two channels in this in this video and guys if you like these collector videos and you like them more than some of the other you know gossip videos that are out there you know share the video like the video subscribe to shane subscribe to this channel if you haven't uh, and help get us out there. Let's get let's get more people watching these collector videos, and maybe we could push down some of these other you know other type of videos. Let's just put it that way that maybe we don't want to see as much in our feed. That's all I'm saying, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, Shane, speaking of your channel, um, you are having. I already did a video response to it, but you're having a uh, 500 subscriber contest with two questions that I love. 
which was basically how has your collecting changed and what extinct brands would you like to see back? So uh, I already made my video and it goes, how long does the, the contest go for? Uh, I put it out to like mid-March. I think you got till maybe Sunday the 19th, I think is what I said. Um, try to give people plenty of time because I, I sometimes record out ahead and I've missed VRs um, from tight timelines. So you still got a little bit of time uh, if you want to get in on it. Um, I appreciate the support and I, I appreciate you doing one and uh, really enjoyed yours. So Yeah, that was fun. All right. Well, Shane, this was a blast for me. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for watching. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Take care.